to the second part. So in the first part, uh, I went through uh, the uh, a recap of uh, some important concepts of uh, uh, deep learning, uh, key concepts that were then useful to extend uh, uh, and talk more about uh, uh, the theory of a distributed uh, deep learning and how actually uh, it uh, is, uh, which are the families uh, that are used, the families of approaches that are used. Um, and I've also presented some open uh, challenges and how they are currently addressed, both from a technical and scientific uh, point of view. And when in this second part, uh, I will uh, talk more about the actual software frameworks that, uh, that, that are used also briefly mention some uh, applications and and, um, and so on. But before uh, doing that, I will briefly also go over uh, MPI uh, for those of you uh, who don't uh, already, who are not already familiar with it. So the message passing uh, interface. So basically it's a, a standard, uh, as the definition says, a standard for exchanging messages, messages between uh, multiple uh, processors. Uh, processes. Um, it's a standard, meaning that actually it's a, it's a set of, you can see it as a set of recipes, uh, but uh, actually there are multiple implementations of MPI. For example, there is uh, an implementation by uh, Intel, there is uh, Open MPI, there is Parastation MPI, Newlish, it's uh, pretty, uh, it's very widely used. Um, but, uh, um, but the important thing here, uh, besides this, is that uh, is, the, is to understand the flexibility uh, in the topologies um, that MPI allows you uh, to uh, basically build and then rely uh, upon uh, for uh, exchanging messages between uh, these uh, workers or processes. So um, here in this uh, figure, uh, I've put uh, the, uh, some, some classic examples like uh, uh, some random connections or a wheel where there is a center. Uh, but most importantly for us, uh, as I was talking about, the ring or reduce is actually the, the one in the center, so the ring. So this topology, which is very important for distributed deep learning um, uh, frameworks. Obviously, uh, MPI is not just uh, what I'm telling you now in a, in a few seconds, but uh, it's much more. But what we are interested today is to uh, basically um, understand um, some of the basic, look at some of the basic operations you can perform, uh, like, uh, as I was saying, exchanging messages point to point, uh, or, uh, for example, uh, you can also send uh, messages, so send an array uh, from uh, one uh, processor to uh, all the others. So this is the broadcast operation. Uh, there is also the scatter where it don't send the same data to the, to the different processors, but actually uh, you send from, from one processor to the others a different uh, subset of the data. Um, there is the gather, which is in a way the opposite operation of collecting uh, the data from uh, the uh, from the other processors um, and there is this operation that I was mentioning before which is uh, pretty important uh, in our uh, I mean in what I was saying before which is the uh, reduce or so the reduction uh, operation where uh, after a collection of the of the elements from the other processors you perform some some operation uh, as I was saying like the sum the product or as in the data parallel approach, uh, the uh, averaging. So uh, this uh, collective operation called the reduce, called reduce in MPI, uh, is actually very important, uh, and it's uh, it lays at the, 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 the at the ground at the foundation of uh, uh, of distributed of modern distributed deep learning frameworks. So um, despite uh, uh, this course not being on these concepts uh, themselves. Uh, for what I'm talking uh, about today, this is uh, this is very uh, important. In a way, you can see it uh, also from uh, from the logo of Horovod uh, that uh, that the the other ring is there uh, 
actually Horovod. So now I'm going to talk more about the frameworks we are using. Horovod, the name originates from a Slavic uh, dance, I think from, uh, uh, from Russia, uh, where people dance basically together in a circle. And since the uh, one of the inventors, creators of Horovod is Russian, I think he took inspiration from, from this folklore uh, dance uh, called again Horovod. Um, and uh, I think it represents pretty well the fact that, uh, in a way, this uh, this framework is based on this uh, dancing on this yeah on this dance between the workers uh, all together, uh, and um, it's uh, it's um, a pretty uh, it's it's a well uh, it's a very um, well supported framework. It's um, it has been out for quite some years now. Uh, Horovod was originally developed by Uber Technologies, Uber Engineering, so the company of the uh, of the taxis or the of the app, let's say, uh, in California, and then became an open source uh, project uh, later, uh, and so with many contributors also from outside the the original uh, the original creator. Uh, it's a framework for data parallelism. So again, uh, just to recap briefly. Uh, multiple replicas of the same model processing uh, different uh, chunks of the training data. Um, so uh, it relies heavily on this concept I presented, uh, briefly presented of MPI. So the, the basically the, the operation, uh, the point-to-point -point operation between the consecutive workers and the reduction operation. So the share and reduce these double steps, uh, these two steps, let's say. Uh, but uh, it works also with um, more optimized uh, um, communication backend compared to MPI. So if you're using NVIDIA, uh, so NVIDIA hardware, NVIDIA GPUs, uh, it, uh, it can use also NCCL or NICL, uh, as they also call it internally, um, to speed up the exchange, this exchange of the gradient. Uh, and the great thing of... Um, of uh, Horovod is that just with adding, a, they claim seven lines of code to your original code written, for example, in Byte or TensorFlow or also MaxNet. It works with a lot of different uh, different frameworks for deep learning. It works on top and just adding, they say, seven lines of code, you can scale uh, up your uh, original uh, initial model. This is true, yes, uh, but obviously, depending on the complexity. So, so Horvod takes care of average in the gradients, but it's agnostic in respect to uh, the data loading part. So it means that you still have to take care of that part. And depending on the complexity of, your, of the way you're loading the data, it might take uh, a bit more than seven lines of code. But if you are able to also scale up uh, somehow your data loading part, then Horovod is really uh, straightforward for adoption and uh, it's, it works uh, really well. But that said, uh, nowadays, so this was the first big one, but nowadays there are also native, uh, native libraries included in TensorFlow and PyTorch with the same purpose. So I would say that, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to have, to have a look at the, also at the code, at the documentation, but they, to me, they don't look much different nowadays. So they are converging and I will comment on that uh, at the end of this lecture. But I've put here also a video for those of you who are into uh, maybe looking at other, at other frameworks like the one embedded in TensorFlow. So since we are in a cloud course, uh, I also want to mention very briefly the fact that uh, Horvod has a sort of uh, plugin extension uh, that uh, can uh, work uh, uh, well on, uh, uh, on cloud uh, uh, resources. So they have basically adapted a little bit the original architecture, um, as I was saying, to basically include a, a sort of uh, driver, Spark driver, uh, which obviously it's 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 a sort of uh, it's 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 a sort of out of the of the original idea of the ring or reduce of this simple ring, but uh, this made possible the 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 let's say the porting uh, towards uh, uh, towards the cloud. So so I think this is also something very uh, very interesting uh, interest for for those who who have access to to the cloud. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I wanted also to show you a very uh, quick example 
uh, from Spark Deep Learning. Um, uh, it's like took some some lines of code here uh, to show you that actually it's it's really just about adding a couple of uh, of comments and then Hormod takes care of of the scaling uh, of the scaling of your code provided that obviously you have access to that uh, to those resources. Uh, so uh, so basically you can see that uh, Spark Deep Learning has, um, comes with an horrible runner, uh, uh, which you can basically instantiate with a number of uh, processes. In this case, it's uh, set to true, uh, to two, sorry. And then you call this horrible run, which is uh, basically it's just a wrapper around uh, the your original code, your original, uh, for example, uh, I don't know your code for classification or object detection and you simply uh, run it like that. So if you look above the picture above, you, you, you basically have the definition of your training loop, um, and uh, which is, again, what you would have uh, initially, so your original code. And um, in principle, just with these additional lines, you would be able to scale these on, uh, on the cloud, which is, uh, I mean, it's great. And on HPC machines, I'm not presenting the code here today, but it's pretty similar. You just add these seven lines of code I was telling you, and uh, and uh, the gradients are exchanged, and so uh, training performed in a distributed fashion. Very interesting, in uh, in my opinion. Um, so I was mentioning that uh, uh, actually, so I was presenting at the beginning of the second part of this lecture that uh, um, these modern uh, deep learning frameworks are based on concepts uh, uh, of uh, MPI. Um, but as I was saying also, newer uh, frameworks uh, heavily rely on optimized hardware and optimized uh, libraries as well. So um, since still uh, this moment, uh, NVIDIA has been the dominant, if not the, the I mean, the, the most important player in that regard, uh, in, when it comes to devices for uh, for the uh, HPC uh, market in terms of uh, GPUs, graphic devices. I'm talking about um, these frameworks were originally uh, optimized very well to to work very well with, uh, for example, the hardware, uh, the, uh, the the MVLink switches. Uh, I believe that at the beginning they were supporting. These switches, uh, switches were supporting four GPUs, then eight, and now you can even uh, go up to 16 uh, GPUs connected, let's say, locally in one compute node. So it's, uh, I mean, they, they, really, uh, they really can guarantee very fast uh, interconnections compared to, to uh, simple, well, simple, to, to PCI, for example, PCI Express and so on. But it's not only about the hardware, it's also about uh, libraries that are optimized to work with that hardware. And this is where NCCL or Nickel that I was already mentioning a couple of slides ago comes uh, uh, at aid. And basically they have uh, sort of re-implemented the, um, the MPI functions, the MPI routines, um, but to, uh, in a way that there there can be uh, direct intercommunication between uh, between GPUs hosted even on uh, let's say on separate uh, separate nodes of uh, a large cluster, and uh, as you can see from these uh, figures here, actually uh, compared to to the simpler uh, case of uh, when you, when you see for example. Uh, the the advantage that gives you in throughput uh, MV link well that's uh, that's pretty impressive compared to PCI as I was saying, uh, but also in general uh, NCCL. So the, the the graph above is for internode uh, uh, for intranode sorry, and the one below is for internode so between multiple nodes of a compute system. And still, if you have for example very fast interconnections like InfiniBand between multiple nodes, uh, then uh, NCCL uh, can work uh, uh, pretty well uh, with that. Uh, so it's a very uh, well optimized, uh, um, very well optimized uh, uh, collective communication library that is uh, I've been using also a lot and also our colleagues uh, 
at uh, JSC. But uh, um, so I want also tell you a little bit more uh, on what I do before I, I, I go on, uh, let's say to, to the final part of this, um, of this lecture. Uh, and um, so I present you, so this is not the only application I've been working on, but it is, I, I would say the, the one that has been run, running for the longer time. Uh, and uh, so here, what we did was um, basically uh, we were using a sort of uh, image net of remote sensing. So remote sensing is my uh, field originally. Uh, so working with satellite imagery here, we had a large data set of uh, Sentinel-2 images, and we wanted to train a convolutional neural network on that for classifying the land cover. So what actually lays on the ground of these uh, patches uh, of our uh, of, of the surface of the European continent. Uh, so they are. Actually, it is a complex data set because uh, it has uh, multiple, it comes at, uh, with multiple bands at different resolution. Not only that, each patch can be associated with uh, multiple classes. So actually, uh, the problem, I mean, you cannot just simply put a soft max layer at the end and be happy with that because actually we wanted to retrieve uh, multiple, uh, multiple, I mean, this, this relationship with multiple labels at the end uh, of our classification. And also, as I was saying, this was a, a large, uh, this is a large data set. So uh, we needed to speed up training, we should have taken otherwise uh, very uh, much a, a long time, too long to uh, be able to also prototype our model. So um, we originally uh, worked with up to 128 GPUs, and um, so used uh, relying on Horovod for the intercommunication and the, the update of the gradients. Uh, I had developed a data loader from the from a, a hierarchical data format file HDF5. Uh, so custom made to optimize also the data loading part in parallel. And we used what was back then, uh, I would say the standard for computer vision, uh, the state of the art uh, ResNet 50, but still it's, it's still much, very much used. So it's still a good model, which it's a good model because it was one of the first, well, it was the first that uh, implemented this skip connection. So that arrow that was uh, on the uh, right side, uh, of the uh, of the weights, uh, basically to the, to 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 make the flow of information of the gradient, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, to to make the information flow better uh, and avoid issues with the vanishing of the gradient, which uh, would be uh, which would happen actually if you stacked a large amount of layers, uh, as in a ResNet 50, which has a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, layers in it, uh, convolutional layers in it. So as I was saying, we, we, our problem was that we had a big data set. We wanted to speed up this and scale this, uh, the training of this model. And so we had to, to use a combination of the techniques I, I, I've been talking about uh, before in the first part of the lecture. So a proper uh, warm up uh, uh, decision to, to, to to use uh, uh, a deterministic annealer for the learning rate. So we had to also employ a scheduler. Uh, we had to use a, a decay scheme in order to achieve uh, satisfactory good enough uh, accuracy in the end. Uh, and um, yeah, so we had to put together, uh, let's say many of these different techniques and understand how to, uh, to, to, to make these, uh, these work. Then we, we basically uh, had, uh, I mean, we could reach uh, some some interesting results. As I was saying, we uh, we managed to 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 use up to 128 GPUs here, but then I scaled this up later also on 256 GPUs, also on, on newer A100 and VDA100 GPUs. Um, as I was saying, you, here you can pretty, I mean, here you can, if you look at this figure, the the one on the top, you can clearly see. What happens to the accuracy? Uh, actually, here is the F1 score, which is another way, another score uh, to compute the how good the model is performing on unseen data. It's basically an average uh, of the um, uh, of the of some other metrics like the true positive uh, and uh, true negative. 
and uh, mm, and what you can observe is that actually we managed to do that up to a point so up to a global batch size of 8000 samples and above that we we still had issues uh, then um, but then uh, I'm pretty happy that so pretty glad that this uh, this year last summer we were uh, able to present with Marcel Ach uh, a work to a sort of, of, of trick to to go around this issue uh, in a in a slightly different way basically uh, using a smaller uh, batch size um, at the beginning and then increasing it once the training was stable and i'm pretty satisfied by it and this application then has also been used by by other uh, so i'm pretty happy about this i would say uh, absolutely not to brag about it but because i mean it has been useful at least to others so that's the, the, the point and uh, after you spend a long time in your phd doing something it's good also if you see that other people are uh, are using it yeah but uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't want to only draw water to uh, yeah, my own uh, wheel, and uh, so uh, basically uh, I want to also to also go on with other uh, with other uh, frameworks. So as I was saying, my work was based on Horvod, so that's why I presented my application using Horvod, but also uh, as I was saying, many others uh, frameworks for distributed deep learning. So um, one of the uh, most recent ones uh, released two years ago by Microsoft is uh, called Deep Speed. And actually, it's very powerful when it comes to model parallelism. So actually, it implements also data parallelism, but uh, it, it uses a combination of different uh, of different techniques that can help training a much larger uh, models than it was before possible. So if your model doesn't fit uh, doesn't fit the GPU uh, then you have to split it then you have to use uh, model parallelism as we were saying in the first part of the lecture and deep speed can uh, help you out with that and good thing of deep speed is that it, its adoption is pretty straightforward so the installation it's is not uh, easy it takes some time but once you install it um, it's it's very similar to PyTorch, uh, so so in a way you can, uh, if you have already PyTorch code, you can reuse most of it, and that's, that's a very interesting feature. But also, the great uh, another great tool um, of Deep Speed is not only model parallelism, but is is optimizer. So don't be tricked by the name optimizer here. We don't mean optimizer in the sense of weights, so optimizing the weights of the model. But here, optimizer is meant to be uh, finding a way to basically uh, efficiently offload some of the computations uh, back to from the GPU to the CPU. Uh, for example, uh, some parts uh, of uh, I don't know of the um, uh, of the data uh, input pipeline. Uh, a bit like uh, Nvidia DALI does actually. So that's uh, that's a very interesting feature that enabled them to train much larger models than it was previously possible. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, I think a, a very, uh, you can see here there is also this number. So models up to 13 billion parameters on a single Nvidia V100 GPU. So, I mean, it's, uh, as they say, 10 times bigger than previous uh, uh, approaches. So, uh, so, I mean, that's 13 billion would mean already, already, I mean, the, the, when in 2020, I think we, we were more or less about that size. So now in 2022, uh, as I was saying, we, we are talking about 500 billion uh, parameters. Uh, but still, uh, I mean, for, for the for other uh, slightly older uh, models for natural language processing, this this would still this would still work well. And also another very interesting feature of DeepSpeed is that it implements uh, the it implement, implements smart ways of optimizing also the attention matrices. So I don't know how many of you are already familiar with transformers. But basically, in that figure we were looking, and I was referring also in the previous slide, so where we had in 2022, we have in 2022 all these big transformers, so like uh, BERT, uh, GPT-3, 
uh, Megatron LM, all those are based on the transformer. And the uh, transformers in the end are just stacks of uh, uh, matrix multiplications uh, based on this concept called attention. Um, the problem of attention is that it is very powerful uh, because it is a, a basically attention is is a global tool. So it, it looks at the at globally at the, at the sequence you are giving as the input, but this uh, has a strong impact in terms of memory requirements. So researchers have been trying over the last few years to try to find smart ways to optimize the memory requirement. And for example, what at deep speed uh, uh, they are using to speed up the, 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 the well, to, to decrease the amount of memory that is required uh, when you use large sequences is to use, for example, sparse uh, attention matrices like this one. So instead of using every connection point to point, uh, just uh, um, sample uh, some of these grid, some points of this grid and use some of them and actually they demonstrated that it's it was pretty successful. So even if you reduce the, the amount of interdependencies between the in between the sequences, still you can obtain very good results. And, and but this uh, this decreases the need for memory uh, in a in a in a very significant uh, way. So so this is also a very very interesting uh, feature, in my opinion. Um, also, I mean, deep speed has, has other features like uh, uh, optimized optimizers. So this time, optimizers in the real sense of uh, uh, of optimizer, like stochastic gradient descent, so really uh, finding the optimal weights for the model during training. And for example, they re-implemented Adam uh, in a smart way so that uh, uh, they can get rid of a lot of uh, um, of uh, communication uh, exchanges between the uh, different uh, devices if needed, uh, because you can again use deep speed also if you want on one single GPU, but if you do use it on multiple GPUs, uh, it comes also with additional features for, um, let's say, uh, uh, faster and more efficient uh, uh, optimization of the weights of the model. And this is also something very interesting, but uh, honestly, there over the last few years, there has been a lot of research uh, in institutes, uh, companies, universities. So there is a lot out there, a lot of re-implementations of, uh, of, uh, of these optimizers. And uh, this is just to give you a, a first a brief introduction, uh, but obviously there is, uh, there is much more to it. It's, this is just to give you an initial hint. Um, in fact, uh, besides, I was telling you and pointing you to that video on TensorFlow Distributed. I was telling you that there is also PyTorch Distributed Library now embedded in PyTorch. There is Horovod. Uh, I presented you Horovod and the application I've developed in Horovod. There is DeepSpeed, but there is much more. So uh, there in Germany, there is, uh, for example, HIT, the HIT uh, uh, toolkit developed also by the Helmholtz uh, uh, institutes uh, that also come with uh, um, a sort of uh, framework for distributing uh, the training uh, for PyTorch, I believe, while, uh, pardon my Italian accent, Tarantella, which is also, by the way, German, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but developed by our competitors of the Fraunhofer. And uh, yeah, uh, but this works with TensorFlow, not with PyTorch. So, so, so uh, that's also interesting, but it doesn't uh, boil down just to, uh, to German institutes. Obviously, there's much more out there. Uh, there is, for example, the power, very powerful suite of software libraries uh, developed by Ray. So, uh, which has embedded a, a lot of very useful libraries from uh, uh, random forest, uh, gradient booster, uh, to, for example, hyperparameter tuning. So that paper I was mentioning with Marcel Arc uh, actually uh, is based on, uh, um, on uh, scaling the, uh, on a sort of double scaling at two levels of, uh, uh, of, the, of my application, my original application, but also trying to, uh, to somehow uh, run multiple instances and find uh, better uh, hyperparameters. Uh, so, so Ray really also 
um, Ray can also be very helpful. Ray also has its own um, re-implementation. So I was showing you the uh, the re-implementation of Adam by the, the speed, but actually, for example, Ray has re-implemented SGD, so stochastic gradient descent, to optimize the distributed training. And so there's there's a lot also there. I've seen also colossal AI, for example. Another very interesting thing that I've seen, uh, if you go to uh, to the repository of this uh, paper that I've, I've uh, copy pasted here. So this efficient large scale language model training on uh, GPU clusters using Megatron LM. So Megatron again is uh, NVIDIA. Megatron is the big transformer trained by NVIDIA people with the help of Microsoft. And uh, I, I, I basically cut out of the code this, uh, this snapshot. Uh, of the import statements because I wanted to show you that uh, uh, for training Megatron, they rely on uh, PyTorch uh, distributed. So um, yeah, I think it is, it is interesting to see also what, uh, what people uh, in the industry uh, do. Uh, and so keep updated, look at these uh, source code and always, um, yeah, always uh, know what's, uh, what's, what's happening. Um, but um, as I was saying, this is a very, uh, it's, it's moving very, very quickly. So you always have to, to update uh, and study, uh, which, is, which is actually great. I mean, I, I love this, this part of my uh, job. But uh, here I have an example um, uh, that uh, uh, I took from a nice uh, YouTube uh, uh, video by Lex Friedman. Uh, who is a podcaster also. I don't know if any of you have ever listened to it. I don't get any, uh, I mean, any money back from recommending it, obviously, but, but it's very interesting sometimes. <laughs> I should. <laughs> and uh, there is this very interesting video where, um, where they, they, he, he tries to, to compute how much it would cost, actually, uh, to uh, train this uh, GPT-3 model and uh, possible GPT-4, which doesn't exist. It's just the human brain, but uh, it's an estimation. Obviously, we don't know how many parameters we would need to, to, uh, to replicate our, our brain. Uh, still, I mean, there are some, uh, some estimates out there. And I mean, it's, you can see that just running one single uh, instance of GPT-3, uh, it's uh, rather uh, expensive. And I tried to also recompute this on my own. Um, and actually prices are now a bit lower. Uh, I looked at the, uh, at the Azure uh, instances, actually. Uh, you can try it out also with the pricing uh, that is in Morris's lecture seven, uh, but I think he used the EC2 uh, instances there. And you, you can try out it and see what, uh, what it would cost. It's still expensive, I think it almost yeah, I think it's also very, very expensive. And that's, that also makes the case of why for us researchers, or for, for me at least, it's good to work also in a, be affiliated with a research, I mean, a research center that has HPC facilities because training these models is uh, really, I mean, out of reach otherwise. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah. And consider that um, this is just one training, but, in, I mean, how many times have I trained my models without any success? So hundreds for sure. So, uh, I mean, this, this probably wouldn't work for us, <laughs> I would say. It gets so more sensitive at the end of the class. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's true, that's true. Yeah, yeah. We, we should take care also of optimizing that part. <laughs> no, but it's... Uh... It was a good example, I think, that connects nicely with all the cloud efforts. Yeah, because in a way also, I think that um, that you know, in a way you can see that in the cloud also, there is more availability of, of resources that were up to some time ago just for HPC. And now instead you can also rent them uh, on, on cloud services if you have money enough, obviously, which is not always the case, but... Uh, Ah, uh, that's good. I mean, it's, uh, it's good that there is this sort of convergence uh, somehow, uh, in my opinion. Um, it becomes slow, it becomes 
close? Yeah, yeah. One of the last slides, but... Yeah, we don't have many more. Uh, you have how much time more? Ten. Yeah. Ten. Maybe we were a little bit over time. Ah, uh, because I, I had. Ah, yeah, uh, because they have thirty-five minutes. I thought ten more, but. Uh... Uh, Okay, okay, yeah, then there was a yeah, misunderstanding on the time, uh, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, here there's not much more. Uh, it was to show you that there are some uh, benchmarks um, available, a bit like a sort of extension of the 21st century of the lean pack uh, for the HPC uh, 500 list uh, developed by uh, Jack Dongara originally, but now, now we have also this for deep learning, uh, so it's, it's really interesting. We do some internal benchmarks, uh, JFC. So this is a courtesy of my colleague uh, who I've already mentioned, great work that showed um, up to which threshold we could, he could scale this up with the help also of other guys there at JFC. So very interesting. I don't have much left. Uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, if you, I mean, there is this Lumi supercomputer. So I was talking a lot about NVIDIA, 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 but actually AMD is also get, getting its own, the share, its own share of the market. Also, Intel is developing a one, it's one API with one uh, CCL, which is the corresponding uh, communication backend of the NCCL of NVIDIA. So, I mean, I've seen that the Aurora, new Aurora supercomputing at, uh, in the United States will be equipped with, uh, with, uh, with GPUs by Intel, actually. So this is very interesting to, to follow up on that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm almost closing. Um, so with that, what I want to, to, to my final remark would be that uh, basically uh, a lot is, is, is going on in this field of distributed deep learning. Uh, there, there is this convergence between HPC and, and, and cloud that you can see. So you can also deploy these frameworks on, on the cloud now. Uh, I've put some nice references here, for example, to this AI as a service, uh, machine learning as a service and what it means. Uh, but basically, uh, well-established solutions are, are becoming stable. Then obviously research is very fast paced, so newer uh, libraries are obviously not as uh, well supported and stable and you have to, to, to spend more time learning them. But still now we have many, uh, many deep learning frameworks that are very, uh, very stable, as I was saying. And uh, I, I would like to, to, to close here with these final questions to, to you. Uh, where do you think we are standing now in this phase, uh, phase of the technological uh, development? So, are we reaching the maturity of this technology? Uh, where are we standing? So, yeah, that said, uh, I have put all the references here if you want to, uh, to find them. And I thank obviously everybody in, in my group and thank you for the attention. Sorry for the bit of over time. The recording will be on. Yeah. Yes, on yeah, it's my fault, my misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, probably. Yeah. Okay.